opportunities. So without further ado, let me introduce the very first speaker of today. It's definitely a story that has benefited from the growth of the oil and gas sector market in recent years. CWC Energy Services is a premier contract drilling and well servicing company operating in Canada and the United States with a complementary suite of oil field services, including drill rigs and surface rigs. It has operation lo locations in Alberta, Denver, and Wyoming. It's listed on the TSX Venture with a symbol CWC. So let's welcome the President and CEO of CWC Energy Services, Duncan Al, to begin our conference with a bang. Duncan, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Gilbert. So, uh, Duncan, I go President and CEO at CWC Energy Services. Uh, I can't predict the future, but I have to remind them that uh, I am of Chinese heritage and we did fortune cookies, so I might know something about what I'm talking about here. So a little bit about the company snapshot. I thought it would be interesting to show uh, where we were in December or at the end of last year uh, and then in May and then where we were at the end of September. Uh, traditionally, we have been trading at a EB to EBITDA multiple around five to six times uh, in our history, in our 17-year history. That made us at the end of December with uh, almost $19 million worth of EBITDA, about a $119 million enterprise value company. Fast forward to the Russian-Ukraine war uh, that occurred in March uh, timeframe and the run-up in energy prices. And we ended up uh, increasing our stock price from 16 and a half cents at the beginning of the year to 30 cents, uh, which resulted in an EV EBITDA multiple in around five times and giving us an enterprise value of about $182 million uh, on higher EBITDA for 2022, being in that 35 to 37 million range at that time. Fast forward again here to our record-breaking results in Q3 of 2022. Uh, we are now increasing our estimates for the year ended 2022 to the 43 to $45 million EBITDA range. Uh, however, the stock price is uh, at the end of September dropped down to a 19 cent range. Uh, that gives us a multiple of about just over three times. While the stock price has, has now improved after our Q3 results, uh, stellar Q3 record results, uh, to, to about 29 cents here yesterday, uh, that's still a multiple, EV EBITDA multiple of, uh, of about four times. And historically, as I said, we have traded in around five to six times. So there is still more room to grow. On a tangible book value basis, we're about 39 cents a share. So at 29 cents, um, it still has not reached the tangible book value of the company. And so we think that an investment even here at 29 cents is, is, um, is a good value uh, for our shareholders. Uh, insiders of this company own 64% of the stock. We have had a 52 week range now of around uh, 13 and a half to 32 cents. And the volumes on our stock have been increasing uh, throughout 2022. As you can see, um, at the, for the nine months ended, we're at 26.8 million shares traded versus all of 2021 at 27 million. So there's more interest in the story. So why do you need to listen to this story about CWC? 2022 is gonna be a record year for, for CWC. We have already broken for the first nine months record revenue, record adjusted EBITDA and record net income in our 17 year history. Every available crew that we have on our rig is working. And if we had more crews, we'd have more rigs working. Um, we have been successful in crewing our rigs, uh, increasing our headcount this year by 200 people to 720 people, 650 of those being field employees. And this is a higher number than our pre-COVID uh, numbers of February 2022, where we had 620 employees. So we have been successful in, in uh, the labor shortage challenges that we have in our industry and being able to increase the um, number of people working on our rigs. So what is the 
uh, growth pattern for CWC? Well, we did two transactions here, and I'll talk about the first one being a 10 triple drilling rig acquisition in November of 2021, uh, where we bought 10 high spec triple drilling rigs in Casper, Wyoming for 17.3 million or US dollars, uh, which is approximately 21.4 million Canadian dollars. Um, this uh, these, this acquisition was done at eight cents on the dollar to build brand new for these rigs. So we paid roughly $2.1 million per drilling rig for what would cost new to build about $42 million uh, to build new. We think that the EBITDA contribution in 2022 is going to be about $14.8 million um, from, from these rigs. And that's a, um, that's a, uh, purchase price multiple about 1.4 times, meaning we will have paid back this investment in about one and a half years. We are going to work these rigs in the Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado region, and longer term, we intend on on migrating some of these rigs to New Mexico and Texas. Following that transaction, uh, that great transaction and great price that we bought these assets at, uh, in June of this year, we bought three more high-spec triple drilling rigs for a purchase price of uh, 7.4 million US, which equates to about 9.6 million Canadian using our credit facilities. Um, our board also increased our CapEx budget by 8.3 million to do the upgrades and level four recertifications on these three triple drilling rigs for a total investment then of $17.9 million. Uh, we estimate that the, the rigs for these three rigs were, were purchased at $5.9 million. And again, the per, to build new on these rigs would have been $42 million to build new. We think that's a really good metric for our shareholders at 2.4 times uh, in terms of uh, the cash flow generation. And this further, <laughs> further expands our presence in the United States, increasing our fleet, drilling rig fleet to 50, 22 drilling rigs. Uh, seven heavy doubles and eight AC triples and five DC triples and two heavy doubles in the United States. So a little bit about the uh, the asset mix and the financial summary. We have seven Canadian drilling rigs. All seven are active today. We have 15 US rigs, uh, 12 of which are active right now. Um, as of last week, the three that we bought in June have now been recertified and we're actively marketing those rigs to customers. Um, on the production services side of our business, we have 143 service rigs, 63 of which are active today. Um, that makes us one of the largest service rig companies by operating hour and rig count in, in the Western Canadian Center Marine Basin. You can see in 2022, the rough split of our uh, contributions from contract drilling versus production services is about 50-50. But we think into 2023, the U.S. business is going to get larger based upon the assets that we bought in the United States here, contributing about 41% to revenue and 50% to EBITDA. So now our contract drilling division is going to be a larger contribution to our overall business uh, of roughly 60% compared to 40% on the production services side. So where is it we work? We're right throughout all the prolific basins in Canada and the United States. You can see that uh, through this map, uh, all of the uh, oil and natural gas basins, we are in those active basins here today. A little bit more about our drilling rigs. We have eight AC triples, five DC triples, and nine heavy doubles. Seven of them are in Canada and 15 of them are in the United States. This is one of the most relevant fleets in Canada and the United States operating in the most active basins being the Western Canadian Basin, the Permian, the Eagleford, the Niobrara, the DJ Basin, the Powder River, and the Bakken. Our rigs go down to about 7,600 meters. And uh, we thought that we would uh, kind of classify these rigs in terms of basins. And, and that's really based on hook loads. And you can see that the bulk of our rig, our 22 drilling rigs, uh, 12 of those rigs are have 222 decadence, which is the hook load uh, capable of going down to the depth levels that uh, are required in those basins. And so this is a, a very, very relevant fleet. 17 of the 22 rigs have uh, pad rig walking systems. Nine have 7,500 PSI pumping systems. Three are carbon reduction biofuel systems, meaning changing from diesel to natural gas uh, at the request of the customer. 
And two of these are electrified in, in the sense that they can take power from highline uh, power poles uh, that are in the region. And what you see here uh, from a picture's perspective is our rig one, which is the very first rig that we uh, built and rig 120, which is our high spec rig in the United States that we just bought. Uh, I thought I'd show here the five-year average for the rig count in Canada. Uh, the shaded area is your five-year average. The bottom is the low year. The top is your highest year in the five-year range. And where we have come from, from 2020 to 2022, uh, 2020 is the dotted blue line. The 2021 is the gold or yellowish uh, line in the middle. And 2020, or sorry, 2021 is the um, gold line. 2022 is the blue line on top. As you can see, uh, we are now trending at the top of the five-year range. And I believe that five-year range is probably 2018. Uh, we are trending at the top of 2018 uh, for drilling activity in the Canadian Basin. Um, the, the, so basically suggesting that drilling activity is very robust in Canada. Um, we have topped out around 230 rigs as a total industry in Canada. And as you can see in 2022, uh, for the winter season, which is usually our bit, uh, busiest time, January, February, March, we were unable as an industry to uh, get back to a 250 rig count basis. Uh, primarily that is because of labor shortages in our industry. And uh, had we more had more people, we could get to those type of levels. Uh, I do anticipate that it will be a struggle to get there again uh, in 2023, but that just means that our pricing is gonna be extremely strong in terms of demand versus supply of uh, drilling rigs. Looking at the U.S. activity on, on drilling rigs, uh, you can see the shaded areas here um, is, uh, is the rig counts for oil and natural gas. Uh, left side is oil and right side is natural gas. You can see that um, from a total rig count perspective, even though oil prices and natural gas prices have skyrocketed to, to historically high levels, our rig counts have not gotten back to the same levels as they have, say, the 2011 era. Um, uh, and I don't anticipate that we will get to those 2011 eras just because we've become much more efficient with our drilling rigs. Uh, but even trying to get back to 2018-19 levels, uh, we aren't at the top. So that, that represents growth potential for the U.S. market in terms of rig count. On our service rigs, we have 143 service rigs, 75 of these rigs are singles, 54 are doubles, 14 are slants, 63 of them are active, and we have 80 parked. Of those 80, I would suggest to you 20 could go out in the field tomorrow if we had rig crews. We are the second largest service rig company in Canada by active fleet and operating hours, and these rigs go down to about 5,000 meters, which is uh, the active parts of the basin for, um, for the Canadian basin. We focus mostly on the maintenance, workovers, and well decommissioning work versus completions. And the reason we do that is because it's a much more steadier work for our field crews. So for those who are unfamiliar with what a service rig does, uh, a service rig goes back to the same well about seven to eight times uh, in its life if it's an oil well. And so it does work at the very top left uh, part of this graph here. When you first drill a well, uh, it gets drilled, then it gets fracked, then you bring in a service rig like ours uh, to go and lay pipe down holes so the oil or natural gas can flow out of the pipe. Uh, as the reserve declines in terms of its production, it, um, a service rig would be required to come in to do maintenance work. Then when it gets to a certain level where uh, work, what we call work over in our industry to increase the production of that well, the oil and gas company would have us come back out and uh, do some circulating work and removing sand and uh, buildup that uh, then ends up producing more out of that well. Uh, the production life goes up. Of course, uh, as the well ages again, it declines, we go back in, get more production until the very end of the um, life of that well where that well is to be uh, considered to be inactive. And uh, at that point, we go in and do well decommissioning work. So this is as repeatable a business model in the oil field services space, uh, going back to the same well over and over and over again in its life, on average, about seven to eight times. 
On the service rig hours here, um, the black line here is our, our 2022 uh, service rig hours. You can see that we are tracking uh, close to our 2019 levels. Uh, the blue line is 2018, where we had a record year following the purchase of uh, one of our competitors in 20, late 2017. We had the most hours and then uh, dropped off because of production curtailment in, that started in uh, November of 20, uh, 2018. Um, the challenge here for us to get back to the 2018 type numbers is really rig crews and uh, the shortage of labor uh, to get back to those 2018 numbers. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the equipment, we're just short manpower. Okay, a uh, little bit of financial results and, uh, of our company. We will do over $200 million in revenue this year. As I said previously, we're at about 43 to 45 million of adjusted EBITDA. We already have 32 million for the first nine months as we reported last Friday. Um, that gives us a net income for the year around 20, in the mid range around $22 million. Our long-term debt is forecasted to be in the mid 40s, uh, about 46 million to 48 million. Uh, leaving us in a net debt position of 10 to $12 million. So extremely good leverage metrics here. In 2023, we think it's going to be another record year for us. And that's not based on more speculative. It's it's really the adjusted EBITDA uh, range of 51 to 54 million is based upon um, is based upon a full year's working of our U.S. drilling rigs that we acquired. We didn't get all of those rigs, six out of those 10 rigs that we bought working until about April, May timeframe. And so the increase here is going to be for a full year period of our U.S. drilling rigs, as well as the three rigs that we just bought um, uh, in June, which we think we will be working uh, in, in the first half of 2023. This is a 12 a trailing 12 month revenue and just a EBITDA chart. The bar chart is the uh, revenue, the line chart is the EBITDA. And as you can see graphically, we are headed higher in terms of, uh, of the results of our company. Uh, and something to note here, if the line chart hits the top of that bar chart, that's about a 20% margin. You can see that our margins are increasing. We're now at around 26% margins uh, to uh, EBITDA margins to EBITDA to revenue. And so that's a very healthy margin, allowing us to put money back into our equipment, um, as well as uh, giving returns to shareholders. On the CapEx front, we have a $30.3 million uh, CapEx budget for 2022, of which 17.9 was for those uh, three rigs that we just talked about uh, that we bought in June. Uh, and you can see from a maintenance capex, we are a sustainable maintenance capex in around four to seven uh, seven million dollars a year. So sources and uses of cash, we are going to generate in around forty two to forty four million of adjusted EBITDA this year. Our interest costs are around two and a half million, even as interest rates increase. Uh, our capex this year is a bit higher just because of those acquisition of those three rigs, leaving us with free cash flow in around ten call it 10 million to 11 million dollars. Um, next year, our free cash flow is going to increase significantly into the 30 million dollar range. And we think that um, our first priority is to pay down the debt in 2022. Uh, but we may be in a position to distribute or return a portion of that free cash flow to shareholders through dividends or share buybacks in 2023. As ESG is much more important these days, uh, we are very proud to re have released in June of 2022 our second ESG report, which profiles uh, our ESG profile in our company. 17% of our total revenue was on well decommissioning work, so basically putting the environment back into the original position that it was before any drilling activity uh, occurred. 2% of our revenue were on things that were not oil and natural gas related, that being carbon capture, helium, saltwater disposal wells. And this year, in June of 2022, uh, we made history uh, drilling Alberta's first two lithium brine wells uh, for one of our customers. We think that uh, much like Leduc number one in 1947 for Imperial Oil uh, created a brand new industry in Alberta for, for drilling for oil and natural gas, uh, we think that the lithium um, brine well that we just drilled here in June of 2022 will open up a brand new industry. And one day we think that our, our uh, CWC iron hand drilling rig number nine will be immortalized in museums. 
Our safety record is impeccable. We had a TRIF rating, a total recordable incident frequency of 1.22, which is a very low rating in our 17 year history. I am proud to say that even as our man hours increase this year, uh, we are lower than one now for the 10 months ended, um, uh, 10 months ended 2022. And so we're I, very I, proud Duncan, of this. You may like to wrap things up because uh, you, if you can squeeze in one or two questions. because Okay, yeah, re really good, real good. So I, I just want to share the last slide here, which is our share price performance. We're one of two companies uh, to have uh, received a share price price performance of, of over 100% uh, from January 1 to September 30th, 2022 uh, in the contract general and well servicing space. And so this is a, even as you can see from this chart, even that when we dipped during COVID in March of 2022, we rebounded very quickly backward or back up uh, into positive territory. And so we're very proud of that record um, and, and this management team. Happy to take questions here. Um, yeah, let me try to squeeze in a couple of questions here. Time's running out. The first one uh, is from Kerry. Is it safe to say that your business relies heavily on a, on a strong energy market? Uh, I, I would suggest to you that we are in a, uh, a robust market and a continuing upward trend on oil and gas. What the market does not seem to appreciate right now is that while everybody's focused on the demand side of the equation being demand destruction due to a global recession, what they don't appreciate is looking at the other side of the equation, which is a supply shortage globally. There are only a couple of countries that can increase their production here. Everybody else is either declining or staying flat. Um, and those two countries are Saudi Arabia um, and, and a couple of other OPEC nations. And those countries are being extremely price disciplined right now with regards to keeping oil prices high. So uh, I think that this is a multi-year run in the North American uh, oil and gas, natural gas industry. There's one last question here, squeeze in from Bruno. Is this energy surface very competitive in your space? And did you need to cut your price during the downtime before to, to get clients? Yeah, I, I would suggest to you that given the amount of free cash flow of happening in our customers, they are not as focused on, on squeezing every penny that they can get from the service companies right now. That's why our margins are increasing. That's why even as inflation happens from fuel supplies and labor, uh, that we can pass that on to our customers and then keep, uh, keep the, even more to the bottom line. So our, our margin, our EBITDA margins have been increasing uh, from that 15% of the low point to now in the 26% range of uh, EBITDA margins. Thank you, Duncan. I'll let you go. We're running out of time. Thank you for sharing your story with us here today. Thanks, Gilbert. Thank you. So uh, let's